program contains graphic historical film. Parental discretion is advised. These are the concentration camps of the Nazi. As they looked when they were liberated by American and Soviet forces at the end of World War II. Today, some of these camps are museums, like this one at Dachau, where tourists from around the world come to see firsthand what they remember from headlines and history books. But new pieces of that history are only now beginning to emerge, and at least one chapter has not yet been fully told. This report concerns allegations that there are more than 200 Nazi war criminals now living in America and that collectively they are responsible for the deaths of as many as two million people. This report will also explore how these Nazis and Nazi collaborators came to this country and how they have managed to stay. And it will present evidence which indicates that some of them have been recruited, protected, and even employed by the United States government. The extermination of 11 million people required more than a handful of murderers. And throughout Europe, both before and during World War II, it was not only German Nazis, but also their collaborators in places like Latvia, Yugoslavia, Romania, who were responsible for the deaths of those millions. When the war ended, thousands of these murderers escaped. The United States is currently a haven for hundreds of such alleged war criminals. Only Argentina and West Germany are thought to have more. In the next hour, we'll examine how they got here, how they managed to stay here, and why effective legal action against them is only starting now, 35 years after the war. These people were not simply soldiers carrying out orders. Rather, they were in leadership positions and are alleged to have been involved in killing operations against civilians. Of the more than 200 such cases under investigation in the United States, only 16 are now in active litigation. Most of those involve Eastern Europeans, thought to be responsible for deaths in their own country. One case is a good example. It comes to trial soon and concerns charges against this man, Valerian Trepa. He's an American citizen and an archbishop of the Romanian Orthodox Church. Bishop Trepa now lives in Michigan, but he stands charged with crimes committed almost 40 years ago, halfway around the world. Rosh Hashanah in Bucharest, 1979. Jewish families come together to celebrate the High Holy Days with blessings and prayers for the new year. But the parents and grandparents of these children remember a time when Jews in this synagogue and throughout Romania lived in terror. On this holy day, Rabbi Moshe Rosen, the head of the Romanian Jewish community, speaks to his congregation not only of the future, but also of the past. A past which is painful to remember, impossible to forget. The rabbi recounts the slaughter of hundreds of Romanian Jews in 1941, and mentions by name a man he holds responsible, Valerian Trifa. Trifa was known, not only for me, for if you will speak to everybody here in Romania, or my generation, if you ask him who was Trifa, 
It's the same thing if you ask a German who was Streicher or who was uh, Hess. Uh, Trifa was one of the leaders of the Iron Guardist. Like Rabbi Rosen, many who were alive in the Bucharest of the 1930s and 40s still remember the terror of the Iron Guard, a fascist and anti-Semitic group which supported the Nazis and was vying for power in the Romania of the early 1940s. Trifa, a leader of the student wing in the Iron Guard movement, led the youth in rallies at the university. Guardists pledged to exterminate Jews, communists, and others on their death list. Elvira Jordachescu remembers the fear created by the violence of Iron Guard legionnaires. Afraid? Sure I was. Sure I was. There was a kind of blacklist. They had made a vow that they would exterminate the Jews categorically. It was an unheard of race hatred. That was one of their watchwords, the blacklist. Lista Negra. The blacklist was basic in the legionnaires' vocabulary. Lista Negra. Madame Chordachescu recalled a ballad used to rally the Iron Guard. In 1941, Iron Guard legionnaires began a revolution against the government. For three days in January, there was fighting in the streets of Bucharest. Before the army regained control, Iron Guardists had also led a pogrom against Romanian Jews, which resulted in looting, burning, and mass murder. During the pogrom, more than 200 people were murdered in this Bucharest slaughterhouse. The bodies were mutilated, hung from these meat hooks, and labeled kosher meat. Among those killed here, a five-year-old girl. The 1941 pogrom continued for days, and many of those in the Romanian Jewish community were forced into hiding. And we were close to the radio to hear every word. We had a voice announcing the camera Trifa will speak. And what this camera Trifa said then is like I had this day because it was the words was the, this decided it was a death sentence for us, word by word. I quote him. Uh, is a Jews, and he used here a word, an insulting word for Jews, Zidane, even if they will hidden in the nest of a serpent, we will find them there and we will kill them there. You this, heard Trifa say that. I heard this tri Trifa, announcing Trifa and Trifa uh, saying these words. Documents from the time show Trifa's name at the bottom of several anti-Semitic manifestos. One of his statements praises Hitler's handling of the Jews. When the pogrom was over, several Iron Guard movement leaders, including Trifa, fled Romania and were tried in absentia. For his role, Trifa was sentenced to life at hard labor. But by the time sentence was passed, Trifa had found refuge in Nazi Germany. Since 1950, Trifa has been living safely in the United States. A former theology student, Trifa was ordained and elected a bishop in the Romanian Orthodox Episcopate of America. He now presides over this Romanian Orthodox Church in Grass Lake, Michigan. Bishop Trifa largely avoids the media and refused to be interviewed for this broadcast. The United States Justice Department will soon bring Bishop Trifa to trial in federal court in an attempt to strip him of his citizenship. The Justice Department claims that Trifa was instrumental in the pogrom of 1941, during which hundreds died, and that he lied about his background in the Iron Guard when he came to this country. Concealing membership in any such organization makes entering the United States illegal. If the Justice Department wins its case, Trifa will be denaturalized, and deportation proceedings will begin. The Trifa case is similar to 15 others now awaiting litigation around the country. Among them, the case of Andrea Artukovic, now a resident of Seal Beach, California, and accused of ordering the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people while he was Minister of Justice in Nazi-dominated Croatia. And this man, Fyodor Fedorenko, a resident of Miami for years, is now charged with lying about his background as an SS guard at Treblinka concentration camp. 
Witnesses say he brutalized inmates, including one man Fedorenko made crawl naked on all fours before shooting him in the head. One thing the defendants share in common is that for decades, they lived untouched by the United States government, even though there was evidence available against them. You presented evidence in 1961 to yes. the Attorney General of the United States. Yes. And nothing happened for at least 14, 15 years. I will be very uh, cautious with my words. What I cannot tell you precisely, I, I will not tell you. But what my impression was uh, from uh, it, it, all my efforts, which I did then, uh, arrived to a certain point in which I had no explanation. Nobody did more nothing. It was so clear, uh, but uh, I had the impression that he's protected by somebody then. Who was protecting him? I am a rabbi, not a prophet. Rabbi Rosen was not the only one trying to get the United States government to move on the Trefa case. Romanian-born dentist Dr. Charles Kramer, now a New York resident, has waited for years for the trial to begin. The fact that's most important is this, that most of these witnesses are going to pass away. They're old people, past 70, most of them. I'm past 80 myself. How long can you wait for the government to, to try a case? Since the 1950s, Dr. Kramer has been providing the government with documented evidence against Trifa. Until recently, nobody but Kramer himself seemed interested. Then you would be interested too. If you knew as much about Trifa as I do, you would like to see the man brought to justice because he's a criminal. I'm also interested for another reason. I'm a Jew. My people were killed. But I'm more interested because 77 people of my family were killed. This is, I have no uncles, I have no aunts, I have no cousins, I have no immediate family on my father's side. The pogrom for which Trifa is alleged to be partly responsible led to the deaths of an estimated 600 Jews memorialized in this Bucharest cemetery. But the Trifa case is only one example. The European countryside is dotted with memorials to those killed by the Nazis. The alleged Nazi war criminals living in the United States are thought to be responsible for the deaths of two million Jews, gypsies, and anti-Nazi partisans. In a moment, we will see how so many suspected Nazi war criminals got into this country and how crimes of this magnitude have been ignored for almost three decades. ABC News Close Up will continue in a moment. Most Americans believe that the escape routes of Nazi war criminals ended in countries like Argentina and Brazil. We now know that they also ended here in the United States. But how and when did these people get into this country? The answers to those questions are troublesome and they have their roots in a complicated history. The indictment accuses these men of major responsibility for visiting upon mankind the most searing and catastrophic war in modern history. Nuremberg, West Germany. Immediately after the war, the United States took a leading role in the prosecution of major German war criminals. It was here that Goring, Hess, Stryker, and others were made accountable before the world. Among the United States prosecution team, Telford Taylor. Uh, the concept of war crimes is that uh, in fighting the war, you have transcended the limits that custom and treaties have put down on what is permissible. Picking up Jews, herding them into camps, and then killing them uh, was not treating the population with that kind of uh, humanity which the rules call for. Military Tribunal 1 sentences you to death by hanging, and may God have mercy upon your soul. When the Nuremberg trials were over, dozens had been executed, hundreds more convicted. But it is estimated that for every Nazi criminal convicted at Nuremberg, 100 more escaped. In 1946, at the newly formed United Nations, the United States pledged to seek out Nazi criminals and return them to the countries in which their crimes were committed. 
But that resolution would soon be tested by forces beyond the control of diplomats. After the war, Central Europe was in chaos, overwhelmed with millions of displaced persons, refugees left homeless by the war or fleeing the advance of Soviet communism. And almost as soon as the war was over, a new war, the Cold War against the Soviet Union, began. During that time, many displaced persons, DPs, sought entry into the United States. But so did many Nazis and Nazi collaborators, hidden in the guise of the people they had persecuted. Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal has traced their escape routes, including the trails which led to America. It was after the war, mixed with other people, they were slave laborers. Uh, or people, they were in concentration camps, not Jews, but also the others, was living with them in the DP camps and claim that they are refugees before communism. In fact, they were refugees from justice. But beyond those who lied their way into the country, others were actually brought in. Nazis were ardent anti-communists, and many of them had important military or scientific knowledge. Thus, they were considered valuable in the new fight against the Soviets. I'm sure that during the Cold War, there was some plan to bring such, such people and to use them. Documents only recently available prove there was such a plan. Here at the U.S. National Archives and at government agencies throughout Washington are stored hundreds of thousands of documents concerning the atrocities committed before and during World War II. Many of these documents grew out of U.S. efforts to prosecute Nazis, but some tell of efforts to actually recruit them. ABC News has learned of one high-level intelligence program that not only allowed war criminals into this country, but did so with the official sanction of our government. Correspondent Michael Connor investigated the details of that program. It was called Project Paperclip, and from the end of World War II to the mid-1950s, it brought more than 900 German scientists to the United States. Classified government documents describe how the Joint Chiefs of Staff administered the program for the American military and the Departments of State and Commerce. Paperclip's goal was to recruit and exploit the best of German brain power for use by both the military and American business. Officially, Paperclip barred active Nazis, but screening procedures were lax and in some cases negligent. Two separate cases illustrate the point. The first is the case of Otto Ambrose, shown here on trial at Nuremberg. Ambrose was a chemist and a director of the notorious IG Farben Chemical Company, which supplied gasoline and rubber for Hitler's war effort. Ambrose is credited with developing a form of synthetic rubber called Buna, and he played a supervisory role in the construction of Farben's Buna plant in the Polish village of Auschwitz. For IG Farben, Auschwitz concentration camp inmates provided a plentiful source of cheap labor. One survivor of the Farben plant is author Elie Wiesel. Those who could work, work. Those who could not were killed. Work, it was actually a slow process of death. No food, no rest. Only work. The overseers were couples, the SS, but also civilians. I was in touch constantly with German civilians who were Meisters. They were in, in charge of the work projects. I was very young. I remember those days because probably uh, more Often than not, I wonder how did I manage to, to do that much work, to carry stones that were heavier than, than I was. And the Nuremberg prosecution charged that each day at Farben's plant, 100 people died from sheer exhaustion. For his role there, Otto Ambrose was convicted of slavery and mass murder and sentenced to eight years in prison. 
But even while on trial at Nuremberg, Ambrose was a target for United States government recruiters from Project Paperclip. As a convicted war criminal, he could not officially join the program. But Ambrose, American government, and American business cooperated in other ways. His prison sentence was commuted after only three years by American officials. And he was helped in a bid to enter the United States by this man, J. Peter Grace, president of W.R. Grace, a major American chemical company. This copy of an internal State Department document describes how J. Peter Grace helped Otto Ambrose in his efforts to enter the United States. In a memorandum to the United States ambassador to Germany, Grace acknowledges that Ambrose was a war criminal. But he adds that in the years he's known Ambrose, and I quote here, we have developed a very deep admiration, not only for his ability, but more important, for his character in terms of truthfulness and integrity. It's not clear precisely what effect this memo had. All we know is that on three occasions, in 1968, 1969, and 1971, the United States State Department waived regulations which should have barred Ambrose from entering the country. And in each of those years, it granted him a special visitor's visa. Why Ambrose was given special treatment is unclear. Both the State Department and J. Peter Grace refused to be interviewed for this broadcast. However, Grace officials confirmed a business relationship between their corporation and Ambrose. Today, Otto Ambrose does consulting work for W.R. Grace and Company and lives here in Mannheim, Germany. Ambrose wouldn't agree to a film interview with ABC News, but in a recent telephone conversation, he told me that following his conviction at Nuremberg, he was contacted by American military and scientific personnel. An army of people came and asked me about my work, he said. I told them all about it. In addition, he told me, only months ago, United States government energy researchers came here to inquire about other aspects of his wartime research. I'm happy to still be working as a chemist, Ambrose told me, but it's funny. Now I'm helping the Americans. Another paperclip recruit who worked for the Americans was a doctor, Major General Walter P. Schreiber, the second ranking medical officer in the German army and an expert in germ warfare. By 1951, Schreiber was working for the United States Air Force in the School of Aviation Medicine at Randolph Field, Texas. But before being hired by the Air Force, Schreiber narrowly escaped being prosecuted at Nuremberg. There are a number of people that we would have tried, unquestionably, if the thing had been going and kept going for another year or two. And the basic reason it didn't was the Cold War. Members of the Nuremberg prosecution team had collected evidence linking Schreiber with medical experiments at Dachau, in which inmates were submerged for hours in tanks of freezing water, and with other experiments on young Polish women at Ravensbrück concentration camp. Here, Nazi doctors inserted wood shavings and ground glass into open wounds in the women's legs to test sulfur drugs. Some of the women died. Others, like Janina Iwanska, have suffered a lifetime of permanent disability. Madame Iwanska now lives in the south of France. She remembers the experiments, and she remembers Walter Schreiber. If I recall, yes, I have to tell you the story. Before the experiments took place in Ravensbrück, before we were brought in for the experiments, all 75 of us had to parade in front of a commission. We did not know if they were doctors, if they were SS. The camp commandant was there. This man was there. Everyone was there. They examined our legs. It was some kind of a parade. We were completely undressed. And if my memory is good, this man was among the group of people who came to select us for the experiments. Evidence such as that forced the Air Force to fire Schreiber in 1952, but not before they had helped arrange his departure. Where is Walter Schreiber today? ABC News asked that question of a number of governmental agencies under provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Some of those agencies sanitized their documents, supposedly to protect Schreiber's privacy. But one 1952 Air Force memo suggests that intelligence agents helped Schreiber get into Argentina. 
If the United States post-war promise to surrender suspected war criminals had been kept, Schreiber should have been sent back to Europe, where he may have been prosecuted. Here in Ludwigsburg, Germany, officials at the Central Office for War Crimes Investigation say that Schreiber's case in Germany is still under active investigation. Schreiber and Ambrose are only two of the hundreds recruited under Project Paperclip. Justice Department officials say there are others who may be guilty of war crimes, but who are now living safely in America. Those and other suspected war criminals who came to this country have been virtually immune from prosecution for almost 30 years. In a moment, we'll see why. Hermione Brownsteiner Ryan, for almost 20 years a housewife in New York City, now on trial in West Germany for crimes she allegedly committed as a guard at Madonna concentration camp. In all the years since World War II, she is the only American resident extradited to West Germany to stand trial for war crimes. At the ongoing trial in this Dusseldorf courthouse, Mrs. Ryan now faces life imprisonment. Her German prosecutor is Dieter Ambach. Uh, Mrs. Ryan is charged in four cases of uh, supporting murder and in five cases of committing murder. One case, maybe the worst, um, of uh, more than 100 children for the gas chamber. And there is still another case where she is charged to have killed uh, somebody by whipping Films such as this, detailing the horrors of Madonna, was instrumental in the legal proceedings which eventually expelled Mrs. Ryan from the United States. The charges against other suspected war criminals now in America are equally serious. Some of those accused, like Mrs. Ryan, were allegedly responsible for deaths of inmates in concentration camps like this one. And yet, these suspects have all managed to stay in the United States for almost 30 years. The beginnings of the Ryan case point to reasons why. Attorney Vincent Chiano was in charge of the Ryan investigation for the Immigration and Naturalization Service. He says these Nazi cases were a low priority, and he had little cooperation from higher up. My budget was something like $2. We, uh, we took money mostly out of our own pockets. Do this. Eventually, my office uh, became devoid of telephone, secretary, and whatnot. Uh, we did this uh, pioneer style. While official support was hard to muster for the Ryan case, it was virtually non-existent for other Nazi cases which the INS became aware of in the 1950s and 60s. By 1974, the lack of action by the Immigration Service became the subject of congressional hearings. Representative Elizabeth Holtzman. Finally, I asked the immigration commissioner about this at a hearing. And I said, what are you doing? Well, I said to him, is it true that there are Nazi war criminals in the United States? And he said, yes, we have a list of alleged Nazi war criminals in this country. And I said, well, what are you doing with that? And there was silence. That commissioner was Leonard F. Chapman. He declined ABC News' request for an interview. In fact, all four commissioners, dating back to 1954, refused to answer our questions about the INS handling of suspected Nazis. Joseph Swing said it was too long ago to remember. James Green said he did not wish to comment. And Raymond Farrell was, according to his wife, traveling around the country indefinitely and could not be reached for messages. And it was clear to me they had done nothing and intended to do nothing on these cases. Why not? I don't know the answer to that. I think there are a lot of theories that people have. There are conspiracy theories. There are theories of bribery, incompetence, possibly anti-Semitism. Um, it may also be that these people came here during the Cold War, claimed to be anti-communists. Their background was overlooked. Nobody really knows the answers. Whatever the reasons, there is no question that the Immigration Service and its senior officials knew about the presence of Nazi war criminals in this country and yet they took no action against them. The failure to investigate these cases in the past means that they may never be effectively dealt with in the future. Last year, following substantial pressure from Congress, the responsibility for investigating Nazi cases was taken away from the Immigration Service, 
and given to a newly created unit in the Justice Department, the Office of Special Investigation. Heading the new unit is a former member of the Nuremberg prosecution team, Walter Rockman. We're looking at some 250 files at this point, give or take. It is conceivable that we may add another 10 or 20. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate past United States efforts to get rid of these people who are alleged to be war criminals? This is a subjective rating? Yes. I assume 10 is the highest rating? Yes. Two. One reason for the lack of action on at least some cases may have been that the suspects had influential contacts. Bishop Trefa, for example, gave an opening prayer at the U.S. Senate in 1955. He has also broadcast over government-sponsored Radio Free Europe. Another Romanian national, Nicolae Malaksa, was able to wield even more influence. Malaksa, a known Nazi collaborator and a wealthy industrialist, was a partner in a munitions business with the brother of Hermann Goring. Their factories turned out weapons for the Nazi war machine. In his own country, Malaksa was a financier of the fascist Iron Guard, the group which led murderous operations against Romanian Jews. In January of 1941, for example, in a forest outside Bucharest, Iron Guardists shot and killed almost a hundred men, women, and children, often mutilating the bodies. Their financial support came from Nikolai Malaksa. Malaksa came to America in 1946 and stayed here until his death in 1965 after resisting efforts to deport him. Even today, a Senate subcommittee is investigating how Malaksa managed to stay and who helped him. Chairman of the subcommittee, Senator Max Baucus. Um, he was brought into this country uh, and should not have been brought into this country, according to our information. He should have been uh, deported, according to our information. But uh, various people in high places, uh, for one reason or another, uh, did not take action against him as they should. Documents show Malaksa's main defense against deportation to be a proposed corporation called Western Tube, a manufacturing firm which supposedly would make seamless tubing. Malaksa claimed he was crucial to Western Tube, and Western Tube was crucial to the nation's defense. Assisting Malaksa in these dealings was this man, Thomas Bewley. Richard Nixon's former law partner. The Western Tube plant was to be built in Whittier, California, and among those who wrote letters supporting its construction was Richard Nixon. Vincent Ciano handled the deportation case against Malaksa. But Bewley testified that he spoke with Vice President, then Vice President Richard Nixon, and that Richard Nixon showed him what? Made available to him certain files on Nikolai Malaksa. Classified files? That's what Bewley insisted. Why would Richard Nixon do that? I don't know. Did Richard Nixon have any other involvement in this case? I do not have direct proof. It was reported to me that he made some calls to the Central Office of the Immigration Service. On behalf of Nikolai Malaksa? Yes. I have here a, a letter which has been retyped for clarity in which signed by Richard Nixon on behalf of Western Tube. Did he also intervene on behalf of Malox's company? That was my understanding. So Richard Nixon seems to have had a fair amount of involvement in this case. Well, I was told that uh, there was a very close relationship between the Malaxa people and the Nixon people, whether it was through Bewley or whether it was independent, uh, I don't know. For whatever reasons, efforts to deport Malaxa failed even though his proposed plant was never built. Nikolai Malaksa, Nazi collaborator and financier of the Brutal Iron Guard, died a millionaire in America. Malaksa was not the only one with friends in high places. According to a General Accounting Office study, seven alleged Nazi war criminals have been employed by the CIA, one by the Department of Defense, and one by the Department of State. In addition, 24 others have had some contact with the CIA or the FBI. Simon Wiesenthal says this practice started immediately after World War II. I alone uh, was working with uh, American organizations uh, like OSS and um, Counterintelligence Corps and Office of Direct Intelligence. And one day I arrested um, a man, he was, he was uh, 
a Ukrainian. And the next day he was free, because at the same time when I arrest him, he was an informer of the military intelligence. Wiesenthal has personally accused this man, Edgars Lapiniex, of war crimes. Lapiniex was once listed by the INS for investigation relating to charges that he killed Jews in Riga prison in his native Latvia. But before an INS investigation could be completed, the CIA appears to have intervened on Lapiniak's behalf. The CIA denies any interference in war crimes investigation. However, this 1976 letter from the CIA to Lapiniak says, it is our understanding that INS has advised their San Diego office to cease any action against you. If such does not prove the case, please let us know immediately. Thank you once again for your past assistance to the agency. Author and lecturer Charles Allen has studied Nazi war criminals in the U.S. for years. His evidence and testimony have been used by congressional committees and the GAO. We asked him about Edgars Lapiniak. The uh, INS did drop their uh, proceedings against Lapiniak, despite the fact that the evidence against him is extremely persuasive, and despite the fact that they had already built up a very solid case against him. Lipeniex has uh, disappeared from the section around San Diego where he was found originally. At the moment, uh, he is not uh, on the uh, list of those any action is going to be taken against, and he is not on that list simply because of CIA intervention, in my view. You think it's that simple? It's as that simple as that. William Colby was CIA director at the time of the agency's correspondence with Edgars Lipeniex. Colby says he does not recall the specifics of the case, but admits that the CIA intervened on Lapiniak's behalf. We asked him about the agency's relationship with alleged Nazi oh, war criminals. Uh, uh, what I'm saying here is that I don't want to say, no, we wouldn't touch one of a man who collaborated with the, with the Nazis with a 10-foot pole, because that would be false. And on the other hand, I don't want to be understood as saying, well, we don't care about these things, uh, because we do care about them. Now, that leaves a rather wide spectrum. And just where on the spectrum we end up with a particular respect to any one particular case, I think is a, a judgment call. It's a question. And if you look at it in retrospect, maybe we even made some mistakes on it. I don't know. Two conclusions can be drawn from all of this. First, the majority of alleged Nazi war criminals living in this country may have managed to avoid deportation because of simple negligence by the Immigration Service. And second, at least some of them may have been protected by influential friends, including intelligence agencies of the United States government. Here we are admitting with the knowledge of government officials, people who are alleged to have participated in mass murder, not the murder of one person, but murder of thousands of people. We let them come here, we let them stay here, we let them become citizens. And it is a sordid chapter because this was done in secrecy. This was never done with the consent of Congress. It was never done with the consent of the American people. And it was uh, something that was contrary to what we stand for as a nation and certainly a sordid, ironic postscript to those Americans who gave their lives to put an end to what Hitler was doing and to stop him. Now we find those people who were Hitler's henchmen back in this country. It's outrageous. In a moment, we'll see what is being done now to correct past mistakes. The fighting and violence of World War II involved millions of soldiers. Only now, 40 years after World War II began, the United States Justice Department finds itself probing the history of that violence trying to distinguish between some who may have been good soldiers and others who may have been unprincipled killers. It is a task made difficult and in some cases impossible by the passage of time. These soldiers, for example, are members of the Waffen SS, Nazi hunting units judged to be criminal at Nuremberg because they sought out and killed civilians. The most recent denaturalization case filed by the Justice Department involves a man who was allegedly a member of a collaboration unit of the Waffen-SS. His name is Chiram Subzikov, and he says he is innocent. Are you a war criminal? Of course not. 
Of course not. Were you ever a member of the Waffen-SS? I never was a member of any Waffen-SS, any so-called elite or an elite German forces. I never was receiving any instructions from anyone. I never gave any instruction to anyone. Absolutely, I have nothing to do with the German so-called Waffen-SS or any organization which is condemned to be war criminals. Charles Allen has obtained official documents from the Soviet Union in which witnesses detail actions allegedly taken by Subsukov as a member of the Waffen-SS. According to these depositions, if you read them carefully, he participated in roundups, he participated in interrogations, he participated in what the SS called sweeps of villages and towns in the North Caucasus area, particularly around his own home area of Krasnodar in the Transcaucasus. Now, some of these depositions state most exactly that he was the responsible directly for the execution of specifically named Soviet citizens. In this case, they were three uh, Soviet citizens. I don't think I killed a chicken in my life. You know, I don't think I am made that tired. I am not uh, half such hard. You've never killed anyone? I don't, I didn't, I didn't. Knowingly aiming at one human being, for what? And, uh, being in that situation when you are accused as you are killer, would you be able to forget? I don't know about you, but I can't. I can't. Neither my great-great-children or grandchildren will be able to forget that. Sherem Subtikov is now Chief Purchasing Inspector for Passaic County, New Jersey, and lives here in the city of Patterson. As an Eastern European charged with lying about his past, Subtikov is typical of many of those currently under investigation by the Justice Department. But his case is also typical in that it relies on foreign documents and witnesses who must recount events which happened almost 40 years ago. And with each year that has passed, the truth has become more difficult to establish. The Justice Department, for example, will probably rely on this captured Nazi war document, which lists Subsikov on the roster of the Waffen-SS. Subsikov claims he never actually served with the SS, but was put on the list and in their uniform by Kuchuk Ulagai, an influential friend who was trying to protect him from the Germans. That friend, like many witnesses in these cases, is now dead. But the fact that these things happened so long ago and that these people are now dead, <coughs> that, that makes it more difficult for you, doesn't it? For me, not for them it makes it difficult, not for me. For me, I am very at ease, my friends. Absolutely, I am at ease. One, two things I am gaining here. One, that next time when they are going to pick up on the innocent man, they will be very careful. Two, I am proving again to entire world, as much as they believe, or some quarters in the world believe, this nation is under pressure of a small minority group. I am proving by my case in, in, in front of the entire world that America is still the country protected by the God, one nation under God, and there's nobody controls except justice. Even though these cases are difficult, many feel a need to continue. Witnesses are in their 80s. Uh, defendants themselves in some cases are old. It may not be possible to bring all the cases, but the other alternative is to do nothing. The wartime experience and the activity of the Nazis were so deliberate an effort to exterminate Jews, gypsies, I mean, uh, such an outrageous assault on all basic moral concepts uh, that I think it is wise not to forget it now, even though so much time has passed, uh, and make reasonable efforts to, uh, to enforce it to when one can, with reasonable assurance that you're not doing injustice, uh, even with the passage of time. Walter Rockler is the man in charge of the new federal effort. He heads a unit of 19 lawyers with an annual budget of $2 million. But Rockler says mistakes of the past have made his job difficult, in some cases impossible. Are there people who are going to get away now because of past ineptitude involving these cases? Without question, there are people who are going to get away. There are people whom, in your stomach, you know, were involved up to their ears in this kind of stuff, but the proof is not not to be gotten at this stage. You've got people who have been living in the United States for 20 or 30 years, passing themselves off as normal citizens, and if you look at them, they certainly look normal. Uh, 
who were involved in programs of uh, widespread murder. I think that's offensive in itself. I don't think there is any remedy for what has happened. As there's a big injustice, then these people will die as innocent, live very well, um, and nobody will know what they committed. When you pardon one, one genocide, and they took part in the genocide, you open the door for the next. The 16 men who have now been accused by the Justice Department have two things in common. Most of them have been in this country for almost 30 years. And most are also old, many suffering from physical ailments. Even if they are found guilty, it's likely that they will die in America. Legal developments in the coming months range from the trial of Bishop Tripa, accused of inciting a pogrom in Romania, to the rendering of a verdict in the case of this man, Vilas Hasners, a native Latvian who now lives in upstate New York. Charges against Hasners include accusations that he forced Jews into a synagogue, which was then set on fire. So before, 250,000 Jews. Hell no, 5,000 gypsies. Last November, students from the State University of New York conducted a vigil in front of Vilas Hasner's home. Auschwitz, four million Jews. Belza, 600,000 Jews. Medenin, 500,000 Jews. Vitgadal, Vitgadash. Organizers said the demonstration was to protest the lack of action on all of these cases. The reason that we're, we're going to Hasner's home is really an act of frustration more than anything else. It's very hard to pinpoint the exact, uh, the exact location uh, that would be best to protest at. But on that cold afternoon last November, Vilas Hasner's was not home. And in the far reaches of upstate New York, there were few others to witness the protest. Yet they continued. It's easier to cope with a subject if you have something to do. You can take a student who reads all the books and who attends some classes about the subject. He feels helpless. What can he do? He's confronted by, by such evil. What can he do? They feel shame, frustration. young people will ever achieve the sense of justice that they're looking for? No. Number one, that we will never get all the war criminals. There are too many. And some of them are protected. Most are protected. But there is a second reason, which is, again, more profound, more subtle. Whenever you think of the Holocaust, there is a basic injustice, and the injustice can never be redeemed, simply because how can you describe the massacre of one million children? There are no words for that. How can you describe the life of one person, one person in Auschwitz? How can you describe one night in a ghetto? How can you describe one selection? How can you describe the son and his father who see themselves for the last time, just one year before the father is taken away? I don't know how to explain it again to my children, to my students, that American agencies paid by American money, protected by American laws, could employ such criminals and murderers and mass murderers. There is no way to justify such a procedure. No way.
This has been a presentation of ABC News.